Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today is a book club episode. We have Dr. Todd Mariama on. He's going to be talking about his new book, Calvin's Ecclesiology, A Study in the History of Doctrine, and it's published by Erdman's. So we're going to jump into that conversation here in a moment but just as a reminder as always we have some show notes information and links to let you guys know about if you go to the link from Erdman's it'll take you to Dr. Mariama's book and you can purchase that for yourself you can find out a little bit more uh, information about uh, Todd Mariama and then um, also there's just some information about how to contact us with just general questions or if you have any requests or uh, anything like that. Um, How to find us through our show is on Twitter, Guilt Grace Pod, as well as Instagram, Guilt Grace Pod. You can email us at guiltgracepod at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube as well. And if you're already listening to us, we assume that you found us through your podcast device. So that's a good first step. And then um, you can also find out how to uh, connect with Peter uh, directly because he is planting a church here in Southern California. Gosh, here in a few weeks or a couple months or so, uh, Santa Ana Reformed. And if you've been following our show for any length of time, you know he's talked about that. And and you can contact him directly if you want to learn more about that and ask him any questions. And of course, we have a thing called Bridge Builders. That's a group of people, companies, publishers, organizations that just financially support us, keep keep our show going for you guys. Um, so yeah, and then there's also a link to find a local reformed church near you. We always want to point you to a church to call home so you can hear the gospel in person as we are called to. And um, so if you click that link and you, I, I believe you just put in your zip code or something like that, and uh, you can just find the closest uh, reformed denominations near you. So enough about all that. Let's go ahead and jump into this uh, good conversation. I'll let Peter further introduce Todd Mariama. Yeah, we are very excited to have Dr. Mariama. Um, Todd, as he was telling us before the show, because neither of us uh, are good enough at pronouncing his name, so we we want to call him by the by the name he gave us too. Uh, but he's a former professor, uh, former president, and former minister, most importantly, uh, of the gospel. And he worked in Japan, and then he retired in Seattle, Washington. So thanks for coming on, Dr. Mariyama. It's a it's a pleasure to meet you, and pleasure to finally have you on. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, this will be. This would be good. Um, and so maybe if you can, if you can tell some of our audience a little bit about yourself, some of your background, maybe where you're from, uh, so people can kind of get acquainted with who you are. Okay. Um, I prepare the text of my responses. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so since English is the second language for me, uh, some portion I may read it so please mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, have, we actually have a, a lot of our listeners don't speak English for first of, language, so, uh, yeah. you know communicating more effectively yeah. i find it's yeah. easier um i was born in tokyo japan in 1939 as you know i'm, I'm old man. (laughs) Uh, I'm currently residing in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I came to the USA for my graduate theological trainings in 1962. Hmm. Some of you listeners may not was not been born there. I have graduated from three theological institutions in this, in this country, uh, just naming them, Westminster Theological Seminary for my professional ministerial training, Yale University Divinity School for one year's academic training, and Princeton Theological Seminary for my doctor, doctoral mm-hmm. student studies. Uh, in addition, uh, I had two-year research opportunities 
from 1970 to 72 at the Institute of the Reformation Studies, uh, University of Geneva, Switzerland, mm -hmm. where I did most of the research and writing of my Princeton Seminary thesis. Mm -hmm. Later, this thesis was published in 1978 as the Ecclesiology of Theodor Biza, mm -hmm. uh, published by Draw in Geneva. As you know, Beza was Kelvin's successor at Geneva yeah. and was a crucially important figure in transmitting Kelvin's thoughts into Reformed Orthodoxy mm -hmm. or Calvinism. Calvinism. Mm -hmm. uh, by this work, uh, therefore, I have been modestly known as a Beza, Beza researcher, mm -hmm. but not so much as a Calvin researcher. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is <laughs> how uh, the background of how I come to publish Calvin's Ecclesiology mm -hmm. is a long and complicated story. Originally, <laughs> I was Calvin's uh, Ecclesiology was the topic of, of my doctoral thesis at Princeton Theological Seminary. 50 years ago it was. Since the reason I chose the seminary was Professor Edward Dowie, then a prominent Calvin scholar. Uh -huh. I was expected to write under him a thesis on Calvin's ecclesiology. After doing considerable research on Calvin, however, I experienced a serious impasse. Uh, it was a serious impasse. Oh. Um, there are two main factors. One, the, although Calvin's writings were precise and his intentions were crystal clear to understand his mindset behind the text, the num two, number two, there are too many and often conflicting interpretations among the so-called uh, Calvin, great Calvin scholars. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of confused how to tackle with Calvin. I, as a result, I switched to the less researched field of better studies. Only after my retirement in 2001, uh, after 30 years finishing the professional <laughs> studies, <laughs> and after 30 years of work in theological seminary and college in Japan, uh, where mostly I was involved in ministerial duties, um, I started afresh to tackle Calvin's sacred geology, only to find that the 21st century field of Calvin studies had moved into that of multidisciplinary studies. Facing this challenging scheme, my primary method, methodological option was to lead the original Calvin text as much as possible in the historical context in order to comprehend the reformer Calvin and his ecclesiology. As a result, an early Japanese edition of Calvin's ecclesiology was published in 2015, uh, published by the to uh, Kyo Bunkan in Tokyo. And now it's as I was introduced, now it's a revised and enlarged edition, English edition, published by Ardman's in mm -hmm. Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's that's helpful. That's uh, that's helpful background because I know, because um, as I was reading some of the stuff on Erdman's, and as we were talking 
uh, through email and this stuff. The, one of the things I didn't know was you had already written some of this stuff before this. So this wasn't this wasn't like brand new that you had just written recently. This is old work from you um, that you're kind of updating as well. Is that is that correct? Yes, correct. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I I saw uh, as a Japanese, I owe uh, to Japanese church my being. Mm -hmm. So primarily, I saw I write in Japanese. Mm. Then the ultimate goal was to publish uh, in English so that the entire Calvin scholarship mm. can criticize my work. Hmm. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you yourself did you translate it from Japanese to Spanish or to <laughs> Of course, the uh, I did. Um, it's not a translation. Uh, okay. It's a device section. So I I wrote um, on the basis of my Japanese publication. I wrote afresh in English. Oh wow! And um, there are many many critics, uh, I mean, linguists and so forth, who could have uh, helped me mm. and improve that the, to make it in readable English <laughs> book. Yeah. I'm no, very that's, grateful for. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. That's helpful, Brackland. You, you've already talked about this a little bit, um, but there, there's so much writing on Calvin already, his theology, um, some stuff written on the church. Uh, so of all these things that Calvin has wrote, um, how, how might this book that you wrote be a little bit different than some things that have been written before? And what are you hoping to accomplish with this book as well? Uh, this is a very straightforward question. <laughs> Why <laughs> I have to write this book? Uh, you are right. Among the 16th century uh, reformer, reformation figures, next to Luther, Calvin is perhaps the most frequently mm -hmm. researched uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Even limiting to his theology in the last 100 years, there has been so many so-called trends in Calvin studies. To name only a few, for example, Besides traditional reformed Calvin studies, there has been Barthian studies, historical studies by professional historians, Roman Catholic Calvin studies, Calvin studies from the perspective of the Erasmian, Lutheran, and Brusselian influence, the ecumenical Calvin studies, and many other studies focusing on Calvin as a historical figure, such as a Renaissance personality, a systematic theology, a man of literature, and so forth. When I started to tackle a fresh Caribbean in 2001, literally, I found the state of Caribbean studies in flux. Hmm. It has been transformed into multidisciplinary studies, and many authors on Calvin are professionals from the field of history, mm -hmm. law, literature, linguistics, cultural studies, and many social sciences. I was a late comer, or far late to do Calvin. Well, I should have given up perhaps, but uh, the question I had at that time was this, if I were to write on Calvin's ecclesiology, was his ecclesiology holistic? And if so, how could I comprehend and present its holistic image? Since you asked me about what I aim to accomplish with this publication, my answer would be this. I leave it to the reader's judgment whether I am successful or not mm -hmm. in presenting the holistic image of Calvin's ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to respond to the remaining parts of your question, let me just 
some distinctive features of my book. Um, as the book, of, book sub, subtitle, A Study in the History of Doctrine indicates, methodologically speaking, it is an interdisciplinary study. Although the history of doctrine is considered, generally considered a discipline in historical theology or church history, in reality, it involves biblical, theological, and historical studies. In terms of Calvin's ecclesiology, the book's methodological aim to integrate what Calvin read about the church in scripture in the theological traditions of the ancient church, the medieval Roman Catholic church, and in the historical context of the 16th century. Number two, as to the study in the history of doctrine, the book's methodological approach places utmost importance on Calvin's text mm. in their historical settings and interpret them accordingly. Through these three readings of the text, for instance, I have come to challenge some of the prevalent theories and the interpretation of the past, past decades and often correct them and present my own. Now, I not, might not be successful, but at least I tried. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number three, as an outcome of this endeavor, first of all, the book portrays Calvin, before my Calvin, as a reformer of France. This is the main uh, emphasis of my book. Mm. It is true that Calvin is best known, Calvin is best known as a reformer of Geneva. Mm. By reading the entire corpus of Calvin's text relevant to his ecclesiology, however, to my utter surprise, I found Calvin to be a reformer of his homeland. France. This means that his ecclesiology as a whole is well understood in the context of the French Reformation. Mm. It is also meant that his first Genevan period, 1536 to 38, his Strasbourg period, 1538 to 41, and even his entire second Genevan period. 1541 to 64 can be read from this perspective of the reformer of France. Number four, in addition, <clears throat> the book sees Calvin's for ecclesiological development to be in three stages or in three distinctive forms, which the book calls his Catholic, reformed and reformation ecclesiology. As a Catholic ecclesiology emphasizing church Catholicity and unity was an idea of the 16th century humanists. The young humanist scholar Calvin formulated it in his first institute. As an established reformer in 1540s, upon the basic stratum of his Catholic ecclesiology, he formulated his most distinctive ecclesiology, which was reformed ecclesiology in the 1543 Institute, third edition of the Institute. This ecclesiology mainly focused on what he called the legitimate form of the church, legitimate form of the church, mm. and its content occupied the bulk of the final institutes of book four. Mm. So the greatest ecclesiological descriptions Calvin used was written in 1543. Mm. Five. 
to understand Kelvin's ecclesiology more historically accurately, my book proposes a new fresh approaches and new interpretation. I mention only one example, which I consider very important. That is to interpret his ecclesiology in the context of the Eucharist, his Eucharistic doctrine. The first expression of Calvin's ecclesiology found in his first institute of 1536, which I consider one of the most important editions of the institute. When he was writing the first institute, Western, Western Christendom, of which Erasmus, uh, Western Christian, Christendom mm -hmm. uh, was facing the crisis of its breaking into Roman Catholic Catholicism and Protestantism, of which the Erasmus once lamented, no one will undo this universal tragedy, tragedy except to God. Since the Lord's Supper is the symbol of Christian congregation unity or Christian unity, mm -hmm. my book tries to interpret Calvin's ecclesiology in the setting of his Eucharistic doctrine based upon his readings of the ancient church's Christological formation. Mm -hmm. From the Council of Nicaea, to that of Sh uh, Chalcedon, mm -hmm. uh, 325 to 451, the Orthodox Christology was formulated between the two distinctive schools of theology, Alexandria and Antioch, Antioch on the relation of Christ's divinity and humanity or Christ's resurrected body and his human body in history. While the Orthodox Alexandrian school interpreted this relation from Christ's divinity, thus emphasizing the aspect of two natures union, but not fusion. The Orthodox Antiochian schools interpreted the same from Christ's humanity, thus if emphasizing the aspect of the two natures, distinction, but not separation. Important point is, Calvin's Christology clearly indicates that this Antiochian position, uh, incidentally, Bussard's position, uh, and is a cross to and Luther's position is Alexandrian position. Mm -hmm. My book contains that in analyzing his Eucharistic doctrine based on his Antiochian Christology to his ecclesiology in the first institute, he presented two fundamental definitions of the church, namely the four number of the elect, and the congregation of believers. As you know, the combination of these two definitions is a basic character of his ecclesiology. Hmm. That was great, yeah. yeah. Thank, you for, <clears throat> thank you for providing that answer. I think that helps a lot of people understand why this book was written amongst all the other books that have been written on, on Calvin. So I think this will this will help a lot of people understand um, what what is Calvin doing, why is he doing it, how is he doing it, and what time is he doing it, and who is he influenced by. Um, I think this this is very helpful. Yeah, it's awesome. It's very educational. I really appreciate that. Um, my question, my first question would be, how does the structure of this book follow the development of John Calvin's understanding of ecclesiology and Maybe what or who are some of John Calvin's major influences as it relates to his ecclesiology? I know he probably learned from somebody, um, so it'd be good to kind of know 
what, what he, who he got that stuff from as well. Um, it's a very good, good question. Uh, as the first question, the book structure um, follows the chronological development of Calvin's ecclesiology. Um, I would say my book is a fairly large volume of over <laughs> 450 pages. Yep, yep. And, um, sorry to say, it's not that <laughs> I'm hesitant in recommending. <laughs> oh, sorry to add, um, The book is consisting uh, in four chapters. The chapter one traces his formative years in France, culminating in writing the first institute and his famous uh, appended dedicatory letter to the King Francis I in 1539. You know, Calvin's first institute was published in 1536, but he finished the, its writing in the summer of 1535. Uh, the book was written in his exile Basel. Mm. His Catholic ecclesiology is the basic stratum of his entire ecclesiology. This is an important part. It, it, Calvin always maintained this emphasis of church Catholicity and unity. This chapter one examines its scope and depth in the context of Western Christian and French Reformation in the 1530s. The chapter two, the, which is entitled The Early Geneva Reformation and Practice of Catholic Ecclesiology, covers the periods of his first Geneva reform. Uh, as I said, it's 1536 to 38. Mm -hmm. The early Geneva reform was mainly read by not Calvin, but Guillaume Farrell. And Calvin was only joined as its instructor in scripture in 1536. I forced by Farrell to join, as everybody knows. Uh, although Farrell and Calvin were successful in presenting three reformatory documents, called Geneva documents, which consist of confession of faith, instruction, ecclesiastical ordinances, by the way, only instruction was written by Calvin exclusively. The other two are mainly written by Farrell, mm -hmm. and perhaps Calvin helps them. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very intricate uh, story. Interesting. Um, but there, Calvin, Farrell and Calvin's reform failed in 1538 and they are expelled from Geneva. Uh, besides analyzing the three Geneva documents, this chapter examines two crucially important factors for understanding Calvin's ecclesiology. One is the reformatory concepts of a distinguished French humanist and early French reformer, Le Favre de Tabo. Um, by the way, the real relationship between Lefebvre and Calvin hasn't been established yet. Hmm. And I try to scrutinize, but I haven't really come to a conclusion. Hmm. So we, we really don't know, but Lefebvre is a very important a background factor for Calvin's ecological development. Well, by the way, Farrell was a very close disciple of 
reformable. He was a really reformulian, so to speak. Hmm. The second um, factor is Calvin's apology for, the, for his Catholic ecclesiology, uh, especially in his, his leading role in Carolli affair and his writing of a book called Two Epistles in 1537. I will speak on this topic further in a little later. Um, chapter three, the stressful period and transition to new ecclesiology examines Calvin's stressful period, 1538 to 41. Of course, Strasbourg was the city of Martin Busa, and the Bursa Calvin relationship, especially Bursa's influence on Calvin's ecclesiology, is in, in it, its main focus. However, the chapter notes its significance as the period of transition from Calvin's Catholic ecclesiology to his later reform and reformation ecclesiology. Uh, chapter four is entitled Reformed Ecclesiology and Reformation Ecclesiology. How Calvin developed these later two ecclesiology upon the basis of his earlier Catholic ecclesiology is in the long second pe period is a complicated and very difficult question to tackle. Firstly, the chapter noticed that as far as his writings relevant to his ecclesiology are concerned, this period could be roughly divided into two halves, centering around the year 1555. In the first half, Calvin established the basic shape of the Geneva Reformation in the 1541 Ecclesiastical Ordinance, published and um, published the 1543 Institute, which as mentioned earlier, the focus on the legitimate form of the church, and also published the commentaries on the entire New Testament. Hmm. Uh, po my point is, Entire Calvin's new, uh, entire New Testament committees were published in the early uh, first half of this period. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? That's very interesting, yeah. In the second half, 1555-64, the chapter contends that the Calvin's reformatory vision was significantly expanded to the reform of the Christian world. Uh, in this period, he successfully published, successively published the commentaries and the lectures on the Old Testament, especially on the prophetic books, including Psalms. Calvin considered the Book of Psalms as a prophetic book. Mm -hmm. And he also issued the final 1559 Institute and witness the reformed Church of France established in 1559. My book considers the reform of the local church, which was the theme of uh, especially emphasized in 1543 Institute and the reform of the Christian world, which was witnessed in the second period of 1555-64. These are the two reformatory themes which Calvin hid from Busa. Hmm. That's my contention. As your second question of influence, uh, I think that the matter is not so, so clear 
sorry to say to Nick. <laughs> uh, not so clear cut. As a historian of 16th century once said, any inquiry into quote unquote influence in Renaissance personality of the 16th century is quote, endless and highly speculative matter, unquote. <laughs> endless and highly speculative matter. For example, any 16th century figures could use what Erasmus, Luther, Melanchthon, Twingley, and Bursa had written as a common heritage, which they could freely use without, with, without recognizing being influenced. It is true that as a second generation reformer, Calvin inherited many ideas from the Protestant reformers. For instance, in the first institutes, as many scholars assume, Calvin borrowed Luther's major notions, such as scriptures, salvation of faith, Christian freedom, as well as other reformers' distinctive views without naming them. As far as the Calvin's ecclesiology is concerned, however, there is the so-called Bursa's influence theory. This is important. The Bursa's influence theory, which had become a very prevalent view in the second half of the 20th century. And even there are many followers using this concept. The theory is focal. Focal thrust points to the close ecclesiological affinity between the two reformers and the fact that since Calvin moved to Strasbourg in 1538, he owed his later ecclesiological development of Bruce's influence. Acknowledging the ecclesiological affinity between Bruce and Calvin and the fact Calvin learned some notions from Bursa. My book, however, challenged the overall claim of Bursa's influence theory. Mm. Overall claim of Bursa's influence theory. Yeah. And instead proposed to correct correctly place this theory in the entire process of Calvin's ecclesiological development. I will list, especially uh, to Nick, I will list some of reasons for my challenges. One, chapter one examines uh, Calvin's basic ecclesiological formation expressed in the his first institute. And the chapter three examines Bursa's basic ecclesiological formation, very extensively uh, examined. While Calvin's ecclesiology was formulated in the background of humanism and the French Reformation, Bursa, as a professional theologian and doctor in theology, came from Thomistic tradition in Germany. As I explained very extensively, their formation were historically very different. Mm. Now, how can there be influence theory possible? This is my basic question. As you may recall, experiencing the impasse in the Strasbourg Reformation uh, in late 1540s, Bursa moved to England and became a divinity professor at Cambridge University. He was very disappointed in the poor developed uh, achievement in Strasbourg. Mm. 
After his death in 1551, however, among the manuscript documents left behind, there was a document entitled Theological Advice, which was Luther's advice, anonymous advice to unknown person of high position on the reform of the Roman Catholic Church's sacramental system. The document was written around 1540 or 1541 when Calvin was still residing in Strasbourg. The question, the crucial question is the existence of this document was not only, only made known to the researchers in 1970s and early 1980s. And that means, therefore, was not available to the main contributors of the Bursa's influence theories, which was before that, that time. A matter of fact is that without naming Caribbean, Bursa's do the document includes his thorough refutation of the first episode of Calvin's two episodes. It's a thorough refutation and taking name Calvin's and also Calvin's distinct ideas, terminology and so forth. But it is a complete thorough refutation. You know, Calvin's two institute, first episode of, of the two episodes negatively viewed, criticized, and rejected Catholic sacramental system. Mm -hmm. And as the um, kind of anecdote, the question is whether Calvin knew that the Bursa wrote this anonymous document or not. Uh, there's no clear answer. Hmm. But I assume the Bursa was a very careful and considerate reformer, very kind to Calvin, perhaps hide this document from Calvin's recognition. Hmm. Um, I might be wrong, but no, nobody, nobody's perhaps sure. Uh, number three, around 1540-41, Bursa was deeply involved in the church unification colloquies, the unification of Protestant and Catholic churches. Hmm. And he was a leader on the Protestant side. The biggest issue of the time, which was behind the unification corporates, was the question whether the Roman Catholic Church was to be considered the Church of Christ or not. It's a serious question. Hmm. Bursa took, of course, Bursa took the positive position along with Luther and Melanchthon and presented a grand thesis in his, the opening of his theological advice, which read, under papal rule, the church of Christ exists. Under papal rule, the Christ church exists. Well, this was perhaps the clearest, clearest counter proposition to Calvin's negative position expressed in two epistles. Mm. Now, these are only three mm. uh, reasons I'm <laughs> challenging mm -hmm. so-called the Bursa's influence theory. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that this is a this is really helpful, I think, information for people who are, are looking into this study um, and coming into your book too. So we've We've talked a little bit about his background and, and possible influences, even though I know it's 
it's hard to understand or hard to research some of his influence, but um, digging into this maybe a little bit further, the next question, um, are, there, are there some basic emphases, some basic things in, in Calvin that are significant for his development? So what, what, um, what, what's significant? What are, what are some big, big uh, reasons for or big um, emphases in his development of his ecclesiology? Um, frankly, I will tell you both, um, you have prepared a list of very good and difficult questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we, that's what we try to do. And this one is a very difficult question to respond to. <laughs> um, what moved Calvin's ecclesiology? What was the motive behind in his continuously writing on the church, he kept writing from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why did he drastically change the first in institute structure for the second 1539 edition of the institute? Oh, by the way, second edition was published in 1539. Only three, two or three years later, Calvin was preparing the third edition. Why? Hmm. Why only a few years after the second edition did he have to publish the third edition of 1543, in which he incorporated the biggest ecclesiological addition on the legitimate form of the church. There must be many factors and necess necessities behind these questions. However, I would list two main factors which moved uh, Calvin's ecclesiological development. They are what my book calls consistent biblicism and practical activism. Calvin wanted the church doctrine to be strictly grounded on scripture. Or oh, that earlier degree Calvin did. At the same time, he strongly insisted that life and practice of the church be strictly conformed to the church's doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's really the real reformed emphasis. Mm -hmm. Good example of these factors are found in Calvin's apology in Carroll Affairs and his publication of the two episodes in 1537. Uh, by the way, both of the, uh, these two factors are examined in chapter two of my books. Mm -hmm. In Calvin studies, the so-called Carroll affair is often viewed as a minor event in passing or a controversy between a theologian, theologian professional theologian, Carroll, uh, trained in scholastic theology and the humanist uh, reformers, Ferrer and Calvin, who had turned to, from humanism to biblical and theological studies. But the real picture was not so, so simple. In the 1520s, Carroll, doctor of the Paris University Theological Faculty, joined in France uh, in Lefebvre's moderate reform movement, uh, generally known as the Moor Reform, the place, uh, city fairly close to Paris hmm. in France, and it became known in France as a evangelical reformist. He had known for a long time in uh, Farel, uh, in France. And after exiled in Switzerland, he helped Farrell's evangelical work in Lausanne and Geneva. So they, he's very well acquainted 
and he, as a professional theologian, could easily discover problems in Varelu's theology mm -hmm. or ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. Installed as the chief pastor of Lausanne by Berlin's authority in 1536, by the way, Berlin is a huge Protestant uh, and Zwingridian territory, which has a strong influence over Geneva as well as uh, the um, paid war, what they call country of war, mm -hmm. uh, where Lausanne is located. Um, officially, Caroli accused the Geneva ministry, the chiefly Farrell and Calvin, of the heresy of Adianism, the heresy of Adia, mm -hmm. uh, which is arch heretic, so the serious charge. Mm -hmm. And he appealed to the Berlinese authority for decisions or judgment. Acknowledging that the evangelicalism of Pharrell and Calvin was founded on scripture. So they, their theology is based, based on, on scripture. Calvary acknowledged that, but question he asked was whether their position correctly presented the Catholic and Orthodox Trinitarian face of the ancient church. That was the focal point. Thus, the Genevan church doctrinal Orthodox became a crucial issue within the Protestant circle. It's all known all over mm -hmm. in Germany as well as Switzerland mm -hmm. and also in France. Against Carolis, the accusation, um, um, by the way, uh, the Geneva minister who took the main responsibility to defend uh, Geneva orthodoxy was not chief priest Pharrell, mm -hmm. but instructor in scripture, Calvin. Mm -hmm. This is a very important point. Uh, against Carrie's accusation, Calvin presented the, the, a document called Geneva Preacher's Confession on the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity, which, this is important point, exclusively used scriptural passages, but did not use nice increased technical terminology at all. Completely. This was the same as Calvin did in the first uh, institute, chapter two, mm -hmm. uh, in explaining the Apost Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. And then he founded the, um, his Christology. Uh, the pointing to the lack of the creedal terms such as Trinity and Parsons in this document. Carolee rejected the document, the confession, and repeated the demand for Pharrell and Calvin to subscribe the Nicene Creed and Athanasian Creed. By the way, Athanasian Creed is the most anti alien creed among the Catholic creeds of the ancient church. Yep. Without giving in to Carolee, Calvin nonetheless accommodated and submitted again the confession's main text intact, completely intact, mm -hmm. didn't change at all, but added the two appendices, only appendices on Trinity and persons, in which he described the Nicene face of it by using the creed's terminology and clear the point is, he finally clears the charge against the Genevan charge. 
In these two documents, the confession and the appendices, uh, uh, appendix, uh, um, which is entitled Concerning the Expression of Trinity and the Expression of Persons. Calvin even calls the ancient Catholic creeds, quote and unquote, church documents. Mm -hmm. Church documents. And the creeds, technical term of Trinity and persons, ex, quote unquote, expressions. So concerning the expression of Trinity and the expression of persons, these term expression did not bear any dogmatic connotation. What is this? What is Calvin's motive behind mm -hmm. these documents? Mm -hmm. It is clear that Calvin was insisting the Christian doctrine should be based exclusively on the testimony of the scripture. That's the basic point. In the final analysis, Calvary Affair was the occasion of which Kitch, in which young Calvin brilliantly demonstrated both his consistent biblicism and an appeal for the light of the church in history, in this case, the Geneva church, to formulate its own confession on the basis of scripture. In any age afterward, uh, even today, any church has the right to formulate the doctrine on the basis of scripture. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point. The more problematic is the uh, two episodes. And before, both before and after the publication, Calvin's two episodes became known as the controversial work. Mm -hmm. Before its publication, for example, on reading its draft copy, Strasbourg's capital and Busa warned Calvin about its negative effects. In reality, they said, don't publish it. Hmm. After its publication, Calvin's radicalism expressed in this publication became widely known among his contemporaries. Uh, perhaps there was more effect uh, reactions to Calvin uh, in this publication than his institute. Mm -hmm. Well, this is my guess. Mm -hmm. Among modern Calvin researchers, likewise, it's very difficult to place this uh, book in entire development of Calvin's uh, thought. Um, some viewed his radicalism with puzzlement and other negatively judged as a um, marginal work or quote and unquote, raw premical invective. There seems to be no common evaluation of the two episodes among Caribbean researchers today. Uh, the two episodes is a very complex story. Originally, Caribbean wrote two personal letters into two, uh, to his two countrymen on two different occasions. And then he edited drastically, perhaps, these letters into two open episodes without the original addressees. The first episode was entitled in part, quote, on freeing the illicit rights of the wicked, unquote, 
and its main focus was on Roman Catholic Church's practice of worship or liturgy. The second episode was entitled, quote, on the duty of Christian men in the priesthood of paper church, its administration or abandonment, unquote. And its main focus was uh, on the church's ministry. Uh, this book was, uh, episode was particularly addressed to the ministers. Both episodes seems to be aimed at the common group of reform-minded laymen, laymen, lay, lay Christians, and lay Christian leaders or uh, ministers, all are reform minded, who are seeking the moderate church reform within the framework of the French Catholic Church. Um, what my study called Refabri and moderate evangelical humanist is typical of this kind of group, of, of this group. Calvin tried to achieve in the epistle was to challenge these people, challenge them to demonstrate their quote and unquote internal evangelical convic conviction, internal evangelical conviction in quote, outward profession unquote, internal evangelical conviction in heart, in outward profession in action or practice. In other words, he urged them to integrate their internal conviction and external practice. We can illustrate this by taking an, an example from the first episode. If they consider the Catholic mass different from scriptures Lord's Supper and unbiblical, Calvin urged them not to simulate, but to free and avoid the mass. It was simulate, simulation is the one who thinks in the heart that uh, mass is not the same as the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. but in the Catholic Church, but in reality, they participate in, um, in, in the liturgy, with making with you know, so, uh, lots of excuses and so forth, uh, simulations and so forth. Especially, he severely criticized the refabry and distinction between quote and unquote worship and veneration, which is a Catholic position going back to the 8th, 8th century, second um, Nicene Council, which uh, finally decided the worship image worship is biblical. Uh, the worship or through the um, worship the images and um, Virgin Mary and so forth uh, is a act of veneration and not worship. Therefore, allowed to the, to the Christians. Surprisingly, the, the chief um, theologian to formulate this position used a very um, interesting argument that Christ's incarnation invalidated or abolished the second amen commandment mm -hmm. because God became human. Therefore, the second commandment cannot stay any uh, longer. So for the Christian, therefore, it is lawful to venerate 
the images um, in the church. Mm. Well, just kind of wrong explanation. Sorry, I my book discusses the, mm. uh, this development in in detail. Mm -hmm. So the, by this distinction of, of worship and veneration, the, uh, they justify their practice in Catholic image worship. Uh, Calvin challenged this very vehemently. Mm -hmm. In the second episode, Calvin similarly challenged the Catholic priests to reform their church ministry in conformity with the biblical standard of ministry. They didn't deject, Calvin didn't deject Catholic priests per se, mm. but they should conform to the biblical standard. That's the Calvin's insistence. And if they did not or could not, he urged them to abandon their priesthood. This is a very harsh, harsh position. Mm -hmm. In either case, from the radical stance of the practical activist, activism, which Calvin called in this the uh, book, our severity, very severe position, our severe Severe, severe position, severity. Um, he challenged them to make an either or decision. Decide he belongs to Christ's kingdom mm -hmm. or Satan's kingdom. Uh, I tell you, the book is extremely radical. Mm -hmm. and it's a, even today, even for me, it's a difficult to place this book in Calvin's entire develop, theological development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something really neat that I've learned about Calvin is he, he technically didn't have as much of a formal education as, as the other reformers, and he had, he was more self-taught, um, and we know that um, Augustine and Luther, if we read their works, they seem to change over time or they have to write uh, retractions. But did, did, did John Calvin's ecclesiology change throughout his ministry or did he stay fairly consistent um, with his academic and ministry co uh, context? This is another <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> It is generally assumed that Calvin was exceptionally consistent, right. even among the reformers, that is true. Unlike Augustine and Luther, he never officially wrote detractions. He never detracted his view, or he made a mistake as such. Yet, at the same time, the idea of development itself unavoidably involves some sort of change. So it all depends on what you define the change. Mm -hmm. Development can involve, for example, the shift of emphasis, prioritization, amplification, new insertion and extraction, and so forth. The same can be said of his ecclesiology. As far as the basic structure of his ecclesiology, as well as his major ecclesiological concept, concepts such as the definition of the church, church marks, church and state, and the kingdom of Christ are concerned. I think consistency seems to be the norm. As my book presents the three stage development of his ecclesiology, Catholic Reform and Reformation Ecclesiology, his ecclesiology seems to constantly 
moving or constantly moving forward. That much I could say. So I will illustrate uh, in response to this the question of change. Uh, I will illustrate this image of development by the following uh, examples. Number one, concerning the definition of the church, the combination of the four number of elect and the congregation believer expressed in the first institute had been basically kept in the successful editions up to 1559, but with a clear shift of emphasis. That's my point. As the first edition did not fully explain the relationship between these two definitions, the second 1539 edition supplied an epistemological distinction. The church, uh, the whole number of the elect, the church as the whole number of elect to be apprehended, quote and unquote, by faith, by faith. Mm -hmm. While the congregation believers was, quote, un under our cognition and of which judgment is required, unquote. So these are two cognitional levels. In the third 1543 edition, however, the reference to the Apostles' Creed's Holy Catholic Church as the whole number of the elect was dropped, disappeared. However, the double notion of the church itself with the predominant emphasis or increasingly predominant emphasis on the biblical, biblical uh, visible church in history was to survive until the final edition of 1559. However, interesting thing is proportion of these two churches occupy in, in the final institute. The church of the two cognitional level dispro disproportionately placed in book four, chapter one, section one to three. That is only the first three sections of book four, chapter one. Is attributed to the whole body of the elect. Why? And the rest of the entire big book from book four, chapter one, section four, to the book four, chapter 20, section 32, is to the congregation believers. Hmm. Now, this is interesting. Do you call it? change hmm. or development. Two, Calvin consistently maintained the theory of the church's two marks, the word of God and the sacrament of baptism and Lord's Supper as the second mark. From his stressful period on, facing the Bursa's shift from two mark theory, to the three mark theory. Three marks are God's word, the sacrament, and church discipline. The third, Calvin's third 1543 edition introduced an important distinction between the church's title and its form, title and form. While Calvin in this institute closely associated the church's two marks with its title. Uh, in other words, 
church's title is exclusively determined by the two marks of God's word, um, the sacraments, two sacraments. He disso dissociated discipline from the discussion of the church's title. That's a new development. And he discussed church discipline only in the context, connection, context or in connection with the church's form. What does this mean? Number three, another case of shift of emphasis can be seen in Calvin's concept of the church ministry. Challenging the Roman Catholic claim of priesthood exercising Christ's prerogative power, that what Catholic priesthood uh, claim. Calvin's first, first institute uh, rejected the idea and emphasized instead the close association between God's word and the church's ministry. And checking by this association, the Catholic claim, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, emphasizing the ministry as the God's words, quote unquote, ministers, minister. He discussed the ministry, ministries, not the power, but authority. That's the uh, characteristic in chapter one, I mean, the first institute. In his first Geneva period, Calvin faced this time Farrell's congregational polity which is the opposite of uh, Catholics, the concept of priesthood. Calvary's uh, con congregation in congregation of polity, Farrell considered the ministerial power to be derived from the congregation's power, or congregational church, even today, insist on this point. Calvin, mm -hmm. however, uh, uh, in counter to Pharrell, emphasized the indispensable nature of the ministry and discussed the minister's quote unquote power. In Geneva period, he clearly used the uh, term power associated to the ministry. This emphasis was kept when even he, when he encountered Busser's ministerial concept. The Busser was trained in Thomistic um, tradition, that means influence of Arist Aristotelian philosophy was very prevalent. prevalent. And he used Aristotelian um, terms freely, and Calvin really resented mm -hmm. uh, trying to correct them. <laughs> um, so it's an intricate relations. Using the Aristotelian distinction between power and authority, uh, which was um, uh, found in Aristotle's the politics, mm -hmm. uh, famous book. And Buddha cites uh, in margin freely refer to Aristotle's, Aristotle, Aristotle's politics, just like you know, referring to the scriptural passages. Mm -hmm. He cite, cite Aristotle and Plato and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, by using Aristotelian distinction between power and authority, Busa attributed the church's power to the congregation and only its authority to the minister. Mm -hmm. And Kelly okay. obviously was responding to it. Uh, 
-hmm. Now these changes do you call uh, these things do you call the change mm. or the kind of innate development? Mm. That's yeah. a question. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> that was helpful. So based on your uh, extensive research on John Calvin and putting it into this book, how would you, to kind of sum this up and wrap this up in, in uh, a nice kind of, unless Peter's got something else to, to add, how would you define Calvin's ecclesiology? <laughs> Hard question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering what do you have, uh, I'm wondering your intention behind the question. <laughs> <laughs> This is Just a, it's a it's a it's a helpful I think um, defining terms because a lot of our audience is new to these concepts and these yes, categories. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's good. This to is kind really of... perhaps the most difficult question. This <laughs> How can we de describe Calvin's ecclesiology in a nutshell? That was what you were asking for. Have you seen many? description in nutshell. Um, <laughs> it's hard to find even among <laughs> Calvin scholars. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's very difficult to respond. But I'll try to highlight his ecclesiology mm. by using his two image of the church. Mm. One coming from the young Calvin's first inst institute and the other from the psalm commentaries mm. penned by the matured reformer of Geneva. One, in the first institute's last chapter entitled Christian Freedom, Ecclesiastical Power and Political Administration, Calvin presented his reformatory vision of the European world. In reality, it was a vision of his vision of European church. He, here, Calvin Paul's a triangular scheme of Christ's kingdom, church, and state. Christ's kingdom on the top, perhaps, if, if it's triangular. Uh, and the church and state at two lower corners. Mm -hmm. Upon the basis of the, his Ant Antiochian Christology, emphasizing distinction but not separation, he, for he formed his concept of Christ's kingdom. First of all, or the kingdom's transcendental reality sharply distinguished from its imminent manifestation in history. The transcendental reality could not be univocally identify, identified with any earthly institution or the government, such as church and state. At the same time, any attempts of the church or state to identify itself with this transcendental reality were to be rejected. As in the, in the case of the Roman Catholic Church, Calvin accused uh, their usurpation of Christ's kingdom because Roman Catholic Church identify itself of the kingdom Christ on us. In the case on the other side, the Calvin's first institute was formulated just in the midst of so-called the Munster Anabaptist revolution and in, in which the Anabaptists took over the city of Munster 
and try to reform the church and claim that church is the earthly kingdom of Christ. Mm -hmm. And Calvin was reacting to this, um, the minister Anabaptist revolution as, quote, a Jewish vanity to seek and to enclose Christ's kingdom within the elements of this world, unquote. Secondly, Christ's transcendental kingdom was to be connected with church and state as the kingdom or kingdoms, two manifestations. Yep. Calvin called church and state the spiritual kingdom and the political kingdom and consider them as kingdoms, two ministers, mm. political power is minister of Christ kingdom as much as the church as the minister of his kingdom too. He further postulated the three relationship between kingdom, Christ kingdom and church, kingdom, and state and church and state as a total manifestation of Christ's kingdom. I repeat, three relationship between kingdom, church, kingdom and state and church and state as a total manifestation of Christ's kingdom. And I believe this was the vision of his high ecclesiology. The second factor, based upon Calvin's Genevan lectures, 1555 and 1556, his psalm commentaries was published in 1557. In this work, Calvin presented two very interesting and distinctive and opposite eschatological image of the church. One appeared in Calvin's comment on Psalm 135, in which he compares the whole world to a theater where God's justice, wisdom, and power were in full play, and where, quote, the church is a more illustrious part, just like the orchestra of the theater, unquote. The other appeared in his comment on Psalm 129, in which he commented that the faithful lamb from Old Testament church that the church had, quote, always toiled under the cross, always toiled under the cross, unquote. The combination of the church as the orchestra, a very noble high praise, and under the cross, lowly, lowly existence, the orchestra of the church on high, overseeing the affair of the whole world, and the church under the cross, or the church below, bearing Christ's cross. How do you image the, these two opposite reality, uh, yet which they're forming one common reality? That was Calvin, I believe, saw that the what the European uh, church is. I believe here was Calvin's eschatological vision of the European church. Mm. Well, this much I can say. That's mm. all I can say, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mariyama, so much for 
for taking the time to talk about your book to distill your book into this episode. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure people who are listening to this are going to learn a lot and um, are going to, are going to go get your book and, and learn a lot from your book too, to see, to see a lot of this stuff played out in full. Um, some of the stuff that you're talking about in this episode. So um, yeah, thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you so much for coming on our show to talk about this book. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you. Um, all the best wishes and the best wishes to the listeners. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. I'm thank sure you. they're going to see Calvin's Ecclesiology. is like, I got to get that book because it says Calvin <laughs> in the, in the title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, thank you. And yeah, hopefully we can keep in touch and, uh, and still talk. So it's, it's been a pleasure. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. very much. Thank you. Bye.